When talking about the history of animation, you'd be wrong not to bring up the works of Studio Ghibli. Most notable for the films of acclaimed director Hayao Miyazaki, Studio Ghibli has created a wide range of animated classics from the kid-friendly My Neighbor Totoro to the grim epic Princess Mononoke. After the completion of Miyazaki's The Wind Rises and the late Isao Takahata's Tale of the Princess Kaguya, the studio shut down but has since been revived for Miyazaki to exit retirement again to make another feature. Before it had its brief shutdown, Studio Ghibli had begun branching out into other mediums. Miyazaki's son, Goro Miyazaki, would go on to direct a TV show called Ronya, The Robber's Daughter, along with helping produce international films like The Red Turtle. One of Ghibli's most notable collaborations, however, was with the JRPG developer Level 5 on the PlayStation 3 title Nino Kuni Wrath of the White Witch. Nino Kuni began its development as a DS game subtitled Dominion of the Dark Jinn. A somewhat traditional JRPG, the DS edition of Nino Kuni surprised audiences when it was reported that Level 5 would be working with Studio Ghibli. The company would be providing animated cutscenes done in-house along with Joe Hisaishi, the masterful composer behind Studio Ghibli's film scores, providing music. It was quite a prestigious collaboration, but unfortunately Dominion of the Dark Gen would only see a release in Japan. Thankfully, the anime gods would shineth down upon us lowly weebs as an enhanced edition titled Nino Kuni Wrath of the White Witch was announced, this time as a PlayStation 3 exclusive. At the time, even though an international release had not been announced, I was ecstatic. The game literally looked like a Studio Ghibli movie come to life in video game form, and developed by the guys who did Dark Cloud and Dragon Quest VIII. Sign me the f up. The first gameplay footage was just entrancing. The only other game to truly capture that anime aesthetic was, in my opinion, Naruto Ultimate Ninja Storm, which, while a gorgeous looking game, didn't exactly set the world on fire with its licensed status. Anyway, the press it received was pretty notable, going out of the way to tout Nino Kuni as the first Studio Ghibli game. Thankfully, the game was announced for an international release, published by Bandai Namco, hitting shelves in America January 2013, a little over a year after its release in Japan. Yes, I did buy it on release day. Yes, I did get the Wizards Edition with the actual Wizards Companion book and this precious little drippy plush. I love him so much. <laughs> now the PlayStation 3 version of Nino Kuni is obviously an enhanced edition, with the only similarity with the DS version being the Ghibli art style and similar story. However, the gameplay itself is expanded upon in various ways that truly make it a console release. It absolutely doesn't feel like a port of a DS game in any shape or form. This is masterful JRPG gameplay that I can feel in my bones. <laughs> You know what's also masterful? The story. So let's recap this mother from the beginning. Also, maybe mother is not the best word to use right now. Mm -hmm. Ugh. Spoiler warning, guys. First of all, Nino Kuni Wrath of the White Witch isn't your typical JRPG story. Yes, it's still very much a hero's journey, but there's a really nuanced interior to the characters in the world around them. And you don't end up fighting God at the end. Bye, bitch. What I'm talking about is emotion. <laughs> so much emotion. We start the game in a small town with a sort of timeless Americana vibe. This is Motorville, where our protagonist, a young boy named Oliver, lives with his mother, Allie. Oliver is a good-natured, rather normal young kid, friends with various people in town, making grocery runs to help his mother out, nothing crazy. One day, Oliver's friend Philip, who is a bit of a shit, tells him that the secret project that they've been working on is finally ready for a test run. After being completely obvious to his mom about sneaking out that night, so, you'll be in bed kind of early, huh? Mm -hmm. uh, yes, I suppose I will. Oh, you will, huh? Uh, rewinding a bit. We're slammed in the face with Nino Kuni's stunning presentation right from the get-go. When the game's main menu starts like this, you know you're in for a treat. After some snazzy opening credits, we get our very first Studio Ghibli animated cutscene. It's just so stunningly created, it makes for a fantastic opening to a video game. But back to the story. That night, Oliver and Philip test out their newly built vehicle. Oliver takes the driver's seat and things quickly go awry with the mysterious figure, the titular White Witch, somehow messing with the car. Oliver crashes into the river. Thankfully, Oliver's mother is nearby looking for him and rushes into the water to save him. All seems well and good until Allie falls to the ground, gripping her chest. In a tragic turn of events, Oliver's mother passes away, leaving him an orphan. Mom? Mom? Mom! <laughs> it's legitimately surprising and daring of the game to do this so early, but it sets in motion one of the themes of the game, grief and how he can overcome and grow from it. 
It's a pretty mature topic for any piece of media to tackle, let alone a video game. This isn't meant to scare players away, however. I wouldn't call Nino Kuni a sad game, per se. It's very much a Studio Ghibli-like product. Underneath the whimsical, bright, creative visuals is a strong emotional core that drives everything forward, from the story to the characters to even the gameplay. After Ali passes, Oliver locks himself away in his room while people in Motorville, like the shopkeeper Miss Layla, try to find any way of comforting him in such a hard time. Oliver begins to cry on a little doll that his mother gave him only for it to spring to life into the best video game character of all time, Drippy. Oliver handles this reveal shockingly well along with the preceding fantasy info dump this little guy squeezes out. Drippy is Lord High Lord of the Fairies and he's from an entirely other world from Oliver's. The key connection, however, is that everyone in Oliver's world has a double in the other world, a soulmate, whose lives are intrinsically connected. Oliver's mother's double is the great sage Alicia, who is being held captive by an evil wizard named Shadar. Drippy posits a theory that if Oliver comes with him to his world and saves Alicia from Shadar, it'll bring Ali back to life in his. Honestly, a shaky theory, but in Oliver's grief, he finds hope and reluctantly agrees to help Drippy. To talk real quick about gameplay in Motorville, it's very simple. Everything is displayed in an isometric camera angle where we can simply run around town, deal with cars that get way too damn close to me when I'm crossing the street and talking to the locals. It's all well and good, though the fixed camera angle can prevent you from seeing exactly where you're going sometimes, making acts like running under an archway a crapshoot on whether you're gonna run into a wall or not. Before we can leap into the other world, we first need a wand. I mean, we're basically just looking for a stick, but not just any old stick, no, 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 no. Drippy demands the brownest, uh, stickiest stick. Sure. Oliver isn't having much luck until a mysterious, ethereal little girl with green hair named P shows up, who offers him a perfect stick to turn into a wand. Just as soon as she shows up, however, she vanishes, confusing Oliver as it looks like he's the only one who can see her. And we're off! Oliver leads his old world and enters Drippy's, a fantastical realm full of fantasy creatures and vast, sweeping hills. It's all enhanced by Studio Ghibli's drop-dead gorgeous animation, too. What can I even say about the Studio Ghibli cutscenes done for the game? Well, actually, first of all, there aren't nearly enough. I know, I know, budgetary reasons, sure, 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 but the game is pretty front-loaded with the Ghibli goodness, so after getting to the first major town, there really isn't much in the way of these scenes until maybe another 10 hours or so into the game. It's a bit disappointing, and I wish they were more evenly paced throughout the game's story. What does work about this is that getting these cutscenes makes for a really solid progression reward as you play through, making for a nice surprise. Once we're in this new world, we're thrown into the overworld map where we head to the first city, Ding Dong Dell. Once we get there, we see we can't get into the city due to a guard being brokenhearted. Yeah, remember how I said this was an emotional game? Narratively, it is, but it actually is literally about emotions. Shadar is not only evil in the sense of capturing people like Alicia, but his magic also affects the citizens of the world, leaving them shells of their former selves, whether they're overcome with anger, laziness, or what have you. This is part of the reason why I love Wrath of the White Witch so much. So, sure, most JRPGs are about saving the world and becoming a hero, but here we're also saving people's individual lives as we help them overcome various emotions that have taken control. It's very idealistic, obviously, but it's just a pure powerful notion to not only be helping the world as a whole, but all the way down to the youngest citizens of it. It's satisfying, moving, and wonderful. I could gush, but this video would never end. So, to gain the power to fix the brokenhearted, we head to an enchanted forest north of the city, meet Grandmother Willow, Mr. Derby. The tree is talking to me. And learn about familiars. Familiars are creatures summoned from the pure hearted to help and fight. Oliver gets one and is promptly bonked on the head. Rude. This leads us to the combat of Nino Kuni. Call it a fusion of the tail series and Pokemon. Oliver can fight himself, sure, but his physical damage is, uh, weak, to say the least. He's much more adept at magic, using the spellbook known as the Wizard's Companion to cast all kinds of spells, and trust me, by the end of the game, there are a lot of spells to choose from. Arguably, too many. Your familiars are your primary combat option. You can have up to three per person at a time, and you send them out in real time during combat, fighting, defending, and doing special attacks against enemies. These aren't random encounters either. Enemies run around the world map along with the various dungeons you'll be going through across the entire game. Just run into them or sneak up behind them to trigger a fight, taking you to a small arena for combat to occur. Enemies can also get a sneak attack on you, making it so you can't do anything for the first few seconds of the fight. Combat itself is based on a timed system. Press attack, choose which enemy you want to hurt, and a little clock will make a rotation in the corner of the screen. Once it makes a full rotation, you're allowed to do another attack or any other option at your familiar's disposal. It's real time, so your position on the battlefield is extremely important from being a deciding factor on how much damage you do, depending on when you hit some enemies, to simply being able to dodge certain area of effect attacks primarily from boss encounters. It's very much an easy to learn, hard to master system where once you have an understanding of familiar strengths and weaknesses, and there's a ton of familiars to obtain, combat can be a ton of fun. Now, mind you, it can get pretty repetitive if you don't take the time to understand how all of its systems work, including feeding your familiar snacks to evolve, metamorphosize them into stronger forms, unlocking new abilities and stats. Now then, once we have our first familiar and adorable creature called a Mite that comes with his own little sword and little cape to boot, we go through the first dungeon. 
Dungeons in Nino Kuni are pretty straightforward at first as the map fills in while you run around so you can keep track of your position, along with some minor branching pathways that can lead to treasure. Once we're at the end of this first dungeon in the forest, we encounter the corrupted spirit of the forest who we swiftly defeat. I mean, it's the first boss of the game, not gonna be too bad. Heading back to Ding Dong Dell, we learn the spells Give Heart and Take Heart. In order to heal the brokenhearted, we have to find an individual who's overflowing with a certain emotion that can afford to spare a little for those in need. The lackadaisical guard needs some enthusiasm, and luckily the other guard is full of it. Look at him go. And to cut to the chase a bit, this is the general story trajectory of Nino Kuni in the beginning. We go from town to town, meet the inhabitants, and help them with their problems, all the while Shadar connives with a mysterious white witch, a commanding figure that sits amongst a large council of others that support her every move. Once we've completed Ding Dong Dell, helping defeat the rat king Hickory Dock, who kidnaps the king of the city Tom Tildrum and fixing the king's broken heart, we head south to the city of Alma Moon. Quick aside, the idea of the connection between the other world and Oliver's own is strengthened by fixing King Tom's broken heart by finding his soulmate in Motorville. In this case, Miss Layla's pet cat. It just further strengthens one of the core themes of the game. Bonds that ties together exist for us all to support and lift each other up. This is a family game, guys, and it's making me feel all of the emotions. Oof, I love it. Once we reach the desert town of Alma Moon, we recruit our first party member, Esther. The daughter of one of the great sages, Esther comes with her own familiar and is able to hold two more, allowing us a total of six familiars to use in bout. Her main specialty is using her harp to attract familiars you fight into joining you to keep your party strong and versatile. She also specializes in dying. Constantly. Heading even further south, we end up in the coastal town of Castaway Cove. Their gimmick is they force everyone to wear swimsuits. Alrighty then. It's at this point that we finally get our third party member, Swain the Thief. This fully rounds out our party for the majority of the game with our three humans along with nine potential familiars. Quite the sizable party all in all with giving them equipment and managing their abilities and levels. Thankfully the process is pretty streamlined like where a simple button press can automatically give a character the best equipment in your stock that isn't already in use by someone or something else. It's a nifty feature that really saves on time cycling through endless menus. While we do enter various dungeons and areas fighting traditional bosses throughout Nino Kuni, the fighting spills over into Oliver's hometown of Motorville too. Whenever someone is severely brokenhearted, we have to find their soulmate, like with King Tom, and fight the nightmare that's consuming them. Through these tasks, we get some poignant little mini arcs within the greater story, like with Esther's real-world soulmate in Motorville, Myrtle. We, in fact, briefly saw Myrtle in the beginning of the game, where Philip calls her Starry Mary. What is it with that kid? Turns out she has an illness that keeps her from going outside, and if she tried to leave, her father would get mad. Esther's father, the great sage Rashad, is severely brokenhearted, so when we go find Merle's father, Rusty, we find him angrily locked up in his work garage where he refuses to speak with anyone, including his wife Betty. The nightmare reveals its presence to Oliver, and we fight it off and then use some of the kindness Betty has to heal Rusty's heart, bringing the family together again. Oh, this game, guys, this game! Back in Castaway Cove, we team up with some pirates and gain the ability to travel on the water. Yes, technically this gives us free reign to go anywhere in the overall world, but trust me, stick to the objective for now. Each area has monsters of a certain level, so if you venture a little too far off the beaten path in the first half of the game, well, uh, prepare to be absolutely destroyed. While en route to the continent of Autumnia, Oliver and company are ambushed by Shadar. It's a tough fight, probably the first true challenge of the game. Side note, don't avoid fights on the world map. You're gonna need that experience. And before we can truly even make a dent in Shadar's health, the storm he brought grows stronger and the ship crashes. Oliver and company wake up on a mysterious remote island way off from their destination. Nothing seems to be around, but Drippy seems especially and suspiciously nervous. Old stomping grounds, old friends, and uh, his mother. Yeah, that's her up there. Uh, hmm, hmm, what is this game rated? Ages 10 and up? <laughs> okay, hmm, uh. So the newborn fairies haven't uh, exited mother here yet, so we have to uh, go inside to figure out what's wrong? Yep, yeah, sounds potentially grotesque, but thankfully everything inside just looks like a cute preschool, for, for the most part. We take care of the boss, a big-ass jellyfish, and we find a... Uh, <sighs> <sighs> Alternative exit. Everything's fine. Anyway, that side arc is over with. By the way, I skipped over the duo of comedian fairies, but trust me in knowing they're fantastic. I'm the customer at your weapon shop, right? And you were the proprietor of said establishment. All right, give us a moment. Ba 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 ma 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 ka 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 ka. Get on with it, man. We're finally on to Autumnia, a land perpetually at night, at least just based on the world map. We arrive at the industrial city of Hamlin where people really take the ham part of that title seriously. Literally everyone is dressed in these gaudy oversized pig outfits and it's a little bit silly and a little bit unnerving. Once we hit Main Street we're treated to a pretty spectacular sequence where the buildings all move and separate for a giant parade featuring the ruler of Hamlin, 
also adorned in a pig costume. Swain at this point has been saying he can lead Oliver to the next great sage, but begins to become a bit squarely. We're unable to get the leader of Hamlin's attention in the parade, so we're forced to infiltrate the palace. What follows is a sort of stealth section that, brutally honest, isn't great. Whenever games throw a random new genre at you, it typically never works that well and only drags down the whole experience. Now, Nino Kuni's stealth section is pretty inoffensive overall. Definitely not the worst shoehorned in stealth section I've played. Final Fantasy 15. It's thankfully brief and we're in. Also drippy running around with just a helmet is adorable. Oliver and company find themselves in a large room where a monstrous tank boss blasts in out of nowhere. It's called Porco Grosso, a pretty overt nod to the Studio Ghibli film Porco Rosso, directed by the legendary Hayao Miyazaki. After defeating Grosso, we finally reach the room of the Hamlet Emperor. It turns out the Emperor and the Great Sage are one and the same, a young man named Marcuson. However, he seems to be deeply brokenhearted as well, calling himself ugly and horrific as he uses the pig costume to hide his face. Why am I so... ugly? <laughs> Oliver was hoping to find the great wizard's wand known as Mornstar with Marcuson's guidance, but he seems like a bit of a dead end. <laughs> However, once we leave the throne room, something seems off. By magic and completely unknown means, we find ourselves transported back in time. This works out pretty damn perfectly. Mornstar is now easily accessible as opposed to being locked away forever in the present. While I still don't fully understand how they've been transported, the group venture forth and obtain Mornstar while helping a young Marcuson and his older brother Gaskin along the way. Once we have Mornstar, we're brought back to the present, again by mysterious means. Our next goal is to gather the three stones needed to complete the wand and defeat Shadar. It's at this point where we're truly given free reign to go anywhere in the world and not having to worry too much about how high our level is. And yes, we eventually get a frickin' dragon to zoom around the world in, making traveling around a breeze. This is basically your best chance to grind and really start leveling up your party in preparation for the final part of the game. Now, on leveling up, word to the wise, Tokos. They give you a ton of experience and it's the best way to quickly level up. They can be a pain to deal with, so check out the link in the description below on how best to farm them. Trust me, it is worth it. After floating over some dungeon hazards like the floor is lava and also social interaction in general for me, we arrive at Shadar's Keep to defeat the Dark Wizard once and for all. First of all, Oliver can't save his mother, and that's because of one simple thing. His mother is the Great Sage Alicia. Whoa. After attempting to defeat Shadar, the great sage Alicia escaped into Oliver's world and eventually gave birth to him. Ali and Alicia are one and the same. Not only that, but Shadar is in fact Oliver's soulmate. You see, many, many years ago, Shadar was a young noble named Lucian. One day, he was brought along on a raid to capture a sage deemed dangerous, but the soldiers around him attacked without holding back sparing no one in the process, not even children. Lucian was rightfully horrified by this and attempted to save innocent lives instead, including a little girl who turned out to be the daughter of the sage they were seeking out. Once this was discovered, Lucian was punished and his own village was burned down, killing everyone who lived there. Yeah, I don't have any jokes here, this game gets real dark when it needs to. Overcome with grief and anger, Lucian wandered the world, soon harboring belief that there was no good to be found in it. It's at this point he was discovered by the mysterious White Witch who granted him the power to become Shadar, the dark djinn we know today. Oliver is strongly affected by all this information, especially about his mother's true identity, but he still holds on to his resolve to defeat Shadar and stop his evil no matter what. After defeating him, we see Shadar in his true form as he speaks with Oliver. With Shadar dying, that would mean Oliver will die too. However, we're thrown for a loop with another revelation. Come on, game, I can't handle this right now. Too many feelings. That little girl Lucian saved? That was Alicia. <coughs> Shadar is shocked by this, and finally understanding that his actions did lead to good prevailing in the world in the form of Oliver, severs his ties with him so that while he dies, Oliver can live on. Oliver awakens back with Drippy and the others while Shadar reconciles with Alicia, ending the game on a poignant, bittersweet note. Nah, just kidding. Now, if we were playing the original DS game, Dominion of the Dark Djinn, this is where the story of Nino Kuni normally ends. And still, in Wrath of the White Witch, it absolutely feels like an ending. Yes, the White Witch has been sassily monitoring Oliver's adventure throughout the game, but Shadar was always the primary antagonist as far as the story goes, with Oliver's quest to save his mother the driving force of his character arc. This all comes to a satisfying conclusion here. But well, we still gotta deal with that witchy person listed in the title, good golly gosh. We return to Ding Dong Dell to celebrate the defeat of Shadar and the return to peace for all of the world. However, celebrations are cut short when the White Witch drops a spell called Mana across the land, corrupting the world leaders and turning all of the citizens across the world into mindless zombies. Yeesh, it's quite the turn. It's at this point that P, who has been showing up to help Oliver throughout the journey, makes herself known to everyone else and shows that she has the power to get rid of the mana. 
So now we have to hit all three major cities, Ding Dong Dell, Al Mamun, and Hamlin, and restore the citizenry back to normal. What follows is a somewhat disconcerting series of events that has you running around these typically peaceful cities as the zombie citizens chase you and in general freak you out. <laughs> We also gain Marcus in as a party member with his own set of familiars and magic prowess. In Ding Dong Dell, we have to fight a monstrous version of King Tom. This is why I'm a dog person. And in Alma Moon, we have to fight a terrifying version of its leader, the Grand Khalifa. Honestly though, her regular version was pretty freaky too. <laughs> These fights, along with a Porco Grosso rematch in Hamlin, slowly reveal P's backstory. A long time ago, P was a young queen named Cassiopeia. Eh? Eh? Cassiopeia? Sorry. After tragedy befell her kingdom, she became queen at an incredibly young age. Her council, known as the Zodiarchy, used her youth to their advantage and ran the kingdom without her knowledge of their own selfish means. When Cassiopeia learned of this, she discovered the mana spell, thinking it would bring only peace and happiness to her kingdom and its subjects. When it caused the undead state we've witnessed in the present, she could only sit and watch as her citizens tore themselves apart, the Zodiarchy included. Horrified at the consequences of her decision, she resigned herself in her despair and became the White Witch, a callous shell of Cassiopeia that only desires to end all life to start anew. What was left of her goodness, her kindness, her grace, manifested itself in the form of P, taking the form of Cassiopeia as a young girl. While P would go on to help Oliver, the White Witch stayed shut in her desolate palace in the sky with a fake version of the Zodiarchy there to keep her company. One member of the Zodiarchy, however, secretly became a double agent to helping Oliver and company without the witch's knowledge. This was who sent us back in time to find Mornstar, back in Hamlin. Once the kingdoms have been restored from the Creepy Crawlies, we as a group make the decision to take the fight to the White Witch once and for all. After making it through her palace, featuring these robots that spring to life and make me need to purchase some Depends for myself. Oh f We face the member of the Zodiarchy who helped us as a final test of our power. Now it's time to fight the White Witch. It's an intense battle, but uh, not too bad. Defeated, Cassiopeia finally relents and reconciles with P, returning to her former noble self. However, the Zodiarchy refuses to tolerate this and fuses into this... thing for one final battle, this time fighting alongside Cassiopeia. With the Zodiarchy finally destroyed, Cassiopeia finds a new lease on life and vows to fix all the horrors she has caused. With all peace restored, Oliver is finally able to rest and spend time with all of his friends and eventually return to his old life in Motorville with the knowledge that, while his mother is gone, She'll always be with him in his heart, helping him stay strong against whatever life will throw at him. And that's the story of Nino Kuni, Wrath of the White Witch. All in all, I still consider it a masterpiece of storytelling, even though everything after Shadar's defeat absolutely feels tacked on because... Well, it is. However, Cassiopeia is an interesting enough character that it makes the final fight truly worth investing in along with the big twist of everybody just zombieing it up. I only wish we could have seen the mystery of the White Witch develop more throughout the story rather than mostly at the end, save for the few times P pops up to help Oliver early on. The story is honestly probably the biggest reason why I regard Nino Kuni as such a phenomenal game. As I've said, being able to deal with such mature subjects as death, grief, and renewal in such a beautiful way that can speak to people of all ages is quite the feat for a video game, let alone any piece of media. It features wonderful characters that you just want to root for along with a colorful supporting cast that is goofy, irreverent, and just a lot of fun. The Ghibli influence is all over Nino Kuni from its visuals to to its writing, it's a big accomplishment and developers should be immensely proud of the work they did here. Now on the gameplay side of things, I've always heard divisive opinions. Either the combat works for you or it doesn't. For me, it worked really, really damn well. I loved the great sense of satisfaction I got from leveling up and upgrading my familiars and party members as I created a versatile team that could withstand almost anything that came up against them. Yeah, things can be a bit grindy at points with some difficulty spikes, but that's what those tokos are for. It really isn't that big of a deal in my opinion. I mean, grinding? In my JRPG, if you really wanted me to have any negative thoughts on Nino Kuni, and this is extremely minor, it's some of the side quests. There's quite a lot of side quests in this game, from recovering pieces of heart to collecting certain items, things like that. There's even some extremely heartwarming and even tragic stories that are revealed in these side bits, especially once you gain the ability to speak with ghosts. Because, yeah, that's a thing. This one about a ghost of a girl in a cave that has you raise its familiar for a little bit. Oof, who knew a side quest could get me choked up? Some of the side quests do end up being quite the chore, however, especially the ones from this asshole. Having to collect certain familiars can be a tough task, as first of all, you never know if the one you're looking for will show up in a fight, unless you see them on the world map, and second, whether they'll get little hearts around them when defeated so Esther can use her harp to capture them. It's kind of a crapshoot that can potentially lead to endless fighting just trying to get lucky enough to capture a certain familiar that this guy won't bother to do himself. 
Random number generators in games, guys. Not fun. But that's about it, and what ties it all together is its presentation. Even today, this game's visuals still hold up with its Ghibli design and all the things from characters to environments. It truly looks like one of their anime films come to an interactive life. And this will only be helped by the remaster, which is out now, by the way. 1080p Ghibli cutscenes, let's go! Not only are the visuals a sight to behold, but the music by frequent Ghibli collaborator Joe Hisaishi with help from Rei Kondo is just masterful. Performed entirely by the Tokyo Philharmonic Orchestra, Nino Kuni's score is beautiful to listen to from the bombastic themes of Hamlin to the quieter music of locales like Alma Moon. It's varied, it's distinct, it's gorgeous to listen to. It's one of the best video game scores of all time. What else can I say? Give it a listen beyond just what you've heard in this video sometime. And yes, the Nino Kuni franchise didn't end here. Just last year in 2018, we got a sequel, Nino Kuni 2 Revenant Kingdom on the PS4 and PC. We'll talk about that one later down the line. In the end, I can't recommend Wrath of the White Witch enough. It does have its faults, yes, but they're so small they can't overtake what a true masterpiece this game is. It's one of developer level 5's best and it's not to be missed. If you've never played this game back when it came out, now's the perfect time with the remaster hitting PS4 and PC along with a port to the Nintendo Switch. Portable Drippy? Yes, please!